Well, good afternoon and good evening, everyone. We're sitting from different places of the world this time, so that's actually pretty exciting. We're going global as we uh, aim to do with our message at this division. We do represent the Marine Insider for Quality, Human Development and Leadership Division. As many of you might uh, already have attended these webinars and panel discussion for years, you might be very familiar with us, but for those who are not, we do aim to bring a global human development and leadership at the personal and professional level. So thanks for being here today. We do have um, actually a bit of a change on the panel for this time. Uh, as you might know, as some of you might know, we used to do uh, one webinar uh, a month until last year, and then we decided to actually be a bit more in alignment with our content. And um, we decided to go with panel because we also our body of knowledge, we shifted that into becoming a practice, uh, a bit more an assessment tool that you also could use that it comes to reorganizing the body of knowledge into leading self, leading teams and leading organizations. We did have a panel discussion about leading self back in January. Richard actually, which is uh, right joining right now, it's our uh, division chair. So thanks Richard for joining. You can unmute yourself anytime. And uh, we did have that panel, which you can review on our YouTube channel. That is about leading self. We did have another panel about leading teams back in June. And that was from our co-partner uh, about uh, webinars, Kieran Mann. And she's going to join us today later on and uh, discuss on the question and answers you might have. So please use the question and answers uh, box for any questions you might have during as well as at the end of the last 15 minutes. Uh, this panel discussion will be about leading organizations. We will have a question and answers at the end, but we do uh, expect you to attend about 40 minutes minimum for you to actually get the uh, recertification units that you need for ASQ. This event will be recorded and will be available on our YouTube channel within this week. So before I actually uh, present a bit our panelists, as I said, it's uh, it's a Pretty big crowd today, and we wanted actually to have a balanced point of views when it comes to background, gender, everything we can. So I really, we were really, really grateful for all this talent that we have tonight, and we've had a chance to talk to them during our test webinar. And it's, there is some amazing uh, journeys that they had had, and they are willing to share uh, and, and be with here uh, tonight. So before we actually go there, I would like to give a moment to Richard as well. Uh, very grateful to have him here. He has also been with other panels we had as well. Anything you'd like to share? Yeah. Hi, Sadita. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Okay. Love your Great. books as usual. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Uh, yeah. Thank you, Sadita. And thanks to all of you for attending and especially thanks to all of our panelists. I'm, you know, I'm really excited for this session. I won't kind of rehash some of the things that Sadita mentioned, but I, I will just again highlight that this is a, sort of the final installment in our series of panel discussions that started earlier this year. You know, we're excited about um, what our panelists have to share with us today. Um, but I did want to give a special thanks to Sadita, and then she mentioned Kieran Mann for helping organize this event. Um, you know, this uh, work would not be possible. This panel, this discussion, this event would not be possible without the passionate volunteer work done by people like Sadita and the team uh, behind her and behind myself that helped pull this together. You know, ASQ is a um, a, uh, a worldwide uh, global organization of volunteers who are passionate about quality. Sadita is a great example of that, and she helped help put together this terrific panel today. Uh, if you'd like to learn more about the work of our division, uh, Sadita will mention some more at the end about how to get in touch with us. Um, we will be having a workshop on November 1st, which um, highlights the, the work uh, around leading yourself. You know, especially, if it's a great workshop, especially for new leaders. So I would uh, encourage you all to uh, check that out. Uh, we'll be starting prom promotion about that uh, workshop later this week. Um, but if you want to learn more, uh, Sadita will uh, talk about that later on. But again, welcome to all of you, and especially thanks to our panelists for uh, what they're going to be sharing about leading organizations. Thanks, Richard. It felt like actually I called you to, to talk about us, but <laughs> uh, 
that's uh, that's not the point, but it's actually really good to share why we do this. Uh, I've been doing this for five years, and I hope to see more and more people join. It's a great division. It's a very small group, but it's um, it's very linked to what we go through, as I said, personal and professional life every day. So this is actually the the, the space, a safe space for us to have our our saying. Uh, you are frustrated at work, and here you have the space to actually, what we can we do about it? Maybe these scenarios bring us ideas on what topic we need to discuss next. So you are kind of hands on the experience itself. You are active towards it versus being passive. This is how we actually had Maget join us uh, recently. So we're glad to see that he's very interested and, and as, as I said, based in Egypt. We're very willing to actually open open this geographically as well and have more people join us and bring us different perspectives. So by all means, uh, feel free to share if you'd like to learn more or become part of this team. Um, but let's just start a bit discussing. Uh, when it comes to, as I mentioned, this was the third of the series, leading organizations overall. Uh, but the point here is, as we discussed also with uh, Jeff, Jessica, Nidhi and Sukal during uh, our test panel last week is like, why are we here? Like, why? What brings us here? And instead of going through a traditional bio uh, review of our panelists, I would like actually them to share their own journey and um, about their work, but also impact it had on them or they had when it comes to leading organizations. Why are they here? Because they're volunteering their time as well. So apart from we all like like being here and being seen and all of that, but what really makes them choose this division? What would they like to share? And we'll go more in details as we move on. But I'd like to actually uh, have Jeff maybe introduce himself uh, in a way he likes, in a playful way, which is, is what's uh, the core of his work as well. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, Jeff Harry with Rediscover Your Play. And briefly, my Batman origin story is I saw the movie Big with Tom Hanks when I was in <laughs> third grade and then started writing toy companies in third grade until I got into the toy industry. Um, and I don't know if you've ever gotten exactly what you've always wanted, but then been so disappointed when you arrived. But it was such a toxic environment. At one point, I worked for Toys R Us in their corporate office. Um, and why I'm here is I left that industry. I eventually grew a Lego inspired STEM organization was one of the biggest in the US. Um, and we started partnering with a lot of tech companies like Facebook, Google and Adobe. Um, and they and a lot of them exhibited the same toxic behavior that I saw at Toys R Us. You know, and if we're talking about leading organizations, we are at a crossroads right now. Of where do we want to go? Do we want to bring humanity back to the workplace or do we not? Um, and that's part of the reason why I'm here. Well, thanks for sharing, Jeff. And I like your bold uh, attitude when it comes to bringing uh, companies. I've always shared my own personal experiences. They were actually our client, by the way. My former company had them as a client. Um, but I don't think there is a specific company that just, as you mentioned, the point here is not to say this company did it wrong. We do have these topics over and over, so we do feel that this toxicity or was even humanity ever there to begin with? That's some, some of the questions we might answer today. Um, so it is something that we have to face and be very bold about it. So and that's what I like about these uh, panelists when they join these webinars. They're very, very straightforward and we appreciate that. So thanks for sharing. And we have uh, Jessica who had had some uh, quite decades on uh, corporate <laughs> experience as well and, and transformation and all the cool stuff, especially recently with the technology uh, environment, which kind of forces you to, to kind of change a bit faster. Yeah, absolutely. You, so definitely, definitely a pleasure uh, to participate um, and join this panel discussion. Jessica Atkinson, as it's been mentioned, right now my emphasis is working in transformation office. Um, but humbly speaking, um, I'm an immigrant, woman, lesbian, black. And with- Got it all. Yeah, yeah, checking all the boxes. And, <laughs> and with that being said, um, we can all in our own ways um, internalize and, and, and relate um, to being able to, um, or thinking we need to assimilate or transform. 
right? And so my journey has really been getting to the point of understanding that true defini definition of leadership is being your authentic self. Um, so through my journey, um, I live in the United States. Um, I'm out of um, Texas in the Dallas area, um, but I'm born in the Republic of Panama. So you guys can all see me as a black woman um, who with a Hispanic background, that's the box that I'm checking. And um, what, what that must say to uh, people and how that um, probably um, affects how I see things. And so um, my voice normally is about leading without a title because um, it did take a while to, to understand that once I wanted to make a change, um, that that's all, that's all the tools that I needed in order to engage. Yes, we have uh, titles. I won't say they're not important, um, but those, those, those things will come over time. Um, you know, so I, I definitely wanted to emphasize that point. So just quickly to wrap up, I would, I would state that outside of work, um, I actually have a case in the Supreme Court in the Republic of Panama um, for marriage equality. So that's what I do in my free time with uh, my project management skills. And, um, you know, we work towards uh, one day being able to be the first married women in that country. And, you know, the fact is we've had to move to the U.S. in order to have our marriage recognized. And fortunately, I've been able to join a great company um, that recognize, you know, potential and skill and diversity and the role that it can play in leading organizations. So it's a pleasure to, to be with the team today. Well, actually, we're very humbled to have you here, even though I would like you to represent yourself and uh, because it's a very tricky question when we talk about diversity. Do I ever have like, all this responsibility of representing a whole crowd and which of the crowds? Because as you mentioned, you are many crowds, but aren't we all? Uh, some unsaid and some said, whatever points of view we have on different things. And uh, it's very tricky. Like, uh, are we? Do we really want to push that diversity thing, or do we? Do I want just to be seen, as you mentioned, without the hierarchy title, but also without the title at all when it comes to what 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 do I bring on the table? Has nothing to do with anything else. I did have a chance to actually have my leadership master's thesis on LGBT community, and um, I found some of the most high skilled uh, executive leaders on, on the rugby team that I followed, which was an LGBT community. And there was so much you can learn from having to face these challenges. And it doesn't matter what kind of challenges. So that's why diversity was very inclusive when it comes to any topic. So there is something for sure to learn from that. And um, it would be interesting to see how that also during the conversation we have today, um, translates from your end, because as you said, you're actually have friends in that country that have been doing the same. They came to Boston for the same reason. So what, what did you learn? Like how to face, and I came back after 20 years in Albania and I don't fit at all when it comes to culture wise, because it's so much differences. So even though it's my own country, so it's interesting to see how these um, going to the, the other level doesn't mean lower or higher, but another, another level of thinking helps us yeah. to, to actually go through. And I know you have quite many certifications when it comes to methods, and I like that fact because we want to see also if there is any, uh, on our third part of the panel, is there any other okay. All right. Thank you. methodology way to, to do that? Uh, and as we are talking, I hear somebody is very passionate about being involved, so is me there talking? Uh, marketing. Why? Why is she scaring No, me? no, I think it's the host. The HDNL division host is accidentally okay, off. It's Kieran. Kieran, are you? Hi. Um, do you have the iPhone 14 Pro Max? Okay. Do you know what the wait time is like for pre-ordering? Okay. No worries. Thank you. Living in this digital now. <laughs> we we actually was watching a, um, a webinar before about metaverse, and I was sharing that with Jessica. So maybe something in virtual reality is happening as we're speaking. So it's going to be interesting to to see how we're going to do this uh, organizational leadership in these different realities. But um, oh apart God, from that, so me, they wanted you to. Sorry. 
sorry. Alexa or whoever that person is. <laughs> uh, so Nidhi, how about you? What is your journey and um, what brings you here? Sure. Well, first, thank you so much for including me in this panel today. And I'm a mental health expert, keynote speaker, and consultant. And my journey has been a long one in the mental health realm. Uh, I grew up in a culture as an Indian American where mental health was not a point of discussion. And in college, I actually started to struggle with anxiety. As somebody who had a full scholarship to college, I nearly lost that scholarship because of my undiagnosed mental health challenges. And so I sought therapy and it inspired me to become a therapist myself. But it wasn't until 2016 when I was a leader within a mental health organization that I myself experienced what it's like to have mental health challenges in the workplace. In 2016, I was the leader that would take on so many different tasks. I was the, the training provider. I was the party planner. I would take on as many clients as possible to help out the team, and I loved it. But my best friend of 10 years got diagnosed with stage four brain cancer, and I went from being her best friend to her caregiver in an instant. This changed everything for me because now not only was I carrying leadership responsibilities, I was also coping with grief and trauma in real time. And unfortunately, the organization that I was working with at that time, even though it was a mental health organization, they struggled to find ways to support me in that journey. And so it inspired me to want to help with other organizations to be able to prioritize mental health and well-being in the workplace um, and looking at how CEOs in particular can set the tone in their company culture where well-being and mental health are at the top of the list in terms of draws for employees to, to come and stay with your organization. Um, and so that's where I am today, and that's why I go around speaking about this topic and helping to consult with companies as well. Thanks, uh, Nidia. I'm actually very touched by your story and uh, I didn't know what you went through and I feel like, uh, and that's the thing, we don't know what people go through. And um, I, I even felt when I moved to the leadership program, the master's, I was initially the MBA, almost finished that with a finance degree, almost went to a PhD in finance, very European mindset, you start with one thing and you end it in, and then in the US it was a totally different thing where you change and you reevaluate and reassess everything you, you have in you. But what I also notice is like, how about looking into our degrees, like um, a business degree that prepares people to go into management, whatever that kind of cool management is there. Nothing about psychology there. And then I moved and started working in corporate and okay, there was this wellness and uh, company cares programs and all that fancy stuff that you might go there if you know where that website is in some sort of work day link hidden somewhere else. But tangibly, I didn't feel there is this uh, support, as you mentioned. And uh, sometimes when you are feeling that way, you might not even ask for support. So somebody else should actually be uh, aware of what you're going through and have a way and a system in place for, for them discovering and offering the help. Like whoever, it's like being sick. When you're sick, you don't go, you don't really want to go to the doctor. It's like you should be found. So um, that's why I'm, I'm very grateful for you to be here. We, we did want different perspectives because we have to build organizations, but we are, we're dealing with people and we have to look into all portions of them. What, what leads them, what brings them down and what, what helps them go through. And um, so thanks for being here. And uh, last but not least, uh, Sokol, uh, if he is still with us, I'm very happy to have him join us. Um, he is my uh, best buddy in Albania. He's from Albania. So finally, after five years, bringing somebody from Albania here. So when I talk about communism and all, all the traumas that we have on our back of our hands, even though we feel like we don't, I did learn through, through ASQ actually as well, that many of the things that I, I approach life or work or things like that, there are many hidden things, a very uncovered layers that were uh, some sort of hidden traumas from communism. You know, at least me, I was about 10 years old when we went into democracy, but very, very chaotic uh, way of going. Maybe the country is still in transition. So it's always uh, interesting to hear these stories. And um, I was uh, very impressed from Sokol. I saw him in one of the conferences when I came back about three years ago. Um, it was a Microsoft uh, talk. He was the country manager of Microsoft, but all he was talking about was about people. 
And I'm like, finally, somebody gets this here in this country. So I kind of got attached to, to him at that time and we kept going. So I'm very grateful to, to have him here. And uh, now he's uh, sitting in uh, Vienna. I think he's uh, living there, but right now in Albania. So it's kind of uh, very yes. diverse as well. <laughs> so what's your journey and um, what, what kind of uh, triggers in you when it comes to leadership? Because I've heard you talk, but I'd like you to share your own story. Yeah, thanks a lot. Thank you for having me. I'm also amazed by the by the uh, first uh, colleagues who shared their their stories. And uh, yeah, basically, you know, as as you mentioned, so I I, I grew up in in Albania in a small country, and uh, the I was not actually dreaming to become a leader of a big organization, but uh, I I was dreaming to become when I started computer engineering. I I saw kind of um, the the powerful weapon that uh, that humans would have to use it in to, to become uh, our tool for better humans yeah and and i think that is that is at the core at uh, I, I i worked a lot in the technology sector i worked for multinational companies from different uh, covering different geographies different uh, um, even continents so i i am being inspired by the by the diversity of different cultures but while I was going into my journey, I also had, let's say, from my personal life, I, I had, um, uh, let's say, moments in life that I, I was inspired to live a bigger life. Uh, I, lo I, I lost uh, uh, two brothers of mine by, by uh, cancer and in, in different times. And now also with the experience that we are going through, uh, we, we went through with the COVID, I think that was, you know, that we we have uh, it equipped me with a, with a, uh, necessary um, let's say thinking and point of views to give uh, our let's say organizations uh, a, a kind of a different perspective. Uh, I, I was always inspired, and I met a lot of uh, young people in my in my uh, journey. And uh, when I was talking to them, is uh, basically dreaming big. But also not forgetting, you know, we, we need to be uh, to make sure that we are we are helping um, our community, our society to to develop in 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 a positive way. And I think with the organizations now put into a into a kind of a challenge uh, environment with all these crises uh, that that are happening around, and also you know the climate change, the 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 impact of the technology. The, we we need a lot more thoughts in in how we drive the leadership uh, in the organization going forward. So I'm, yeah, I'm, I'm really keen to, to uh, discuss uh, the thoughts with, with the colleagues here. Well, I didn't know your story at that time when I saw you at the conference, but I, I, I felt there is something, something um, as a mission in you when it comes to people. So I'm actually uh, very glad to hear uh, that you, you do have and you do see this bigger impact and, and mission that you have because I feel like we're all here for a reason and you're um, you're here as well to bring your your voice and uh, your brother's voice as well. So I'm very happy to have you here and thanks for opening up so such a depth and um, it takes a lot of uh, vulnerability and uh, I think we're going to touch into it when it comes to leadership not many people have that especially it's such a big uh, open and public places and that makes a whole a whole difference if we were able to be this vulnerable in front of our organizations our teams i feel like people would be we don't need pity but i'd feel like people would see the, the human before they see something else so it does open to different ways of communicating interacting and, and leading Thanks so much. I really, really appreciate you being so so open to it. And um, and this makes me go to the first question we had. The way we are trying to structure with this panel is about uh, this is why why you're here, but why are we all here? And, and, not, and let's think of it in a bigger uh, perspective, like not just in this panel, but our members and then people who are not members but like to hear about leadership know that this is such a common topic leading teams, leading self, leading organizations, and but yet we're still here. And not because we just don't have anything else to do. Like as Richard mentioned, at least our crowd is very volunteer based and you are volunteers here. So why are we still here? So some something is not, either it's not working 
either we need to change it or as um, Sokol was mentioning, the um, dynamics might have changed. Technology has changed and forces us maybe to, to change and review or at least stop and reflect and see how we can do things differently. So at your, at your experience, uh, wh what do you feel like, may, and maybe common elements here, but what do you feel like um, is the need? Like why? Uh, why do we still need to talk about leading organization? We'll try to keep it at the um, or leading organizations overall, so think from it as a perspective of an executive leader, maybe, and then see what they can do for the overall organizations, even though we're kind of drilling down later on. But this why of why do we still need to talk about it? Like what's there that we're not getting? Jessica, any thoughts that you might yeah, have absolutely. in your all the diverse <laughs> impact? <laughs> absolutely. Um, you know, what I would want to share around what are the biggest challenges, what is happening right now, um, inflation, uh, labor shortages, you know, these are the critical things that, you know, great companies are facing. Um, uh, all, all of us here on this panel, you know, employed, unemployed, we're, we're pushing towards looking at the companies that shape the future. Um, those companies that are shaping the future right now, oftentimes are growing um, exponentially and essentially they, we have to create scalable processes, right? Um, so we talk so much about the technical pieces, but we have to remember behind them, this is an integration of the people and the process. And, and that's where that, that executive uh, perspective then comes from. And before we start shifting and moving, where, what's our perspective around how do our people genuinely feel, not what we perceive they feel, and what way are we going to measure that? And what do our clients really feel, not what do we think they feel, right? And what are, what ways are you going to measure that um, that is a safe space, right? So we talk about measurement, and often, oftentimes they can be the method or the survey or the tool we use um, has a lot of unconscious bias, right? So as leaders, we have to shape um, the way we go about getting and extracting, you know, what's the root cause, what's the best way to design that strategy. So I, I definitely wanted to highlight um, that's where the companies are, are going. Those are the biggest challenges is how do we really get to the root cause of what needs to change and how we want to change it. The vision, the strategy, and the process to, to, to execute that. So why why do you think though it you're making me think when it comes to which is what happens all the time like um, okay technology change then actually technology is changing in a very exponential way so it is changing in a higher speed than uh, we have for the adaptation and, and planning and implementation of it but it's also making me think are we are we seen at the executive uh, and you're there so you know those meetings. <laughs> <laughs> Do you see us uh, lower people in the hierarchy as um, as a tool to make it happen, or do you, like do you see us as a cap? Of, uh, I'm kind of putting myself out here, but uh, jokes apart. Uh, but do you see people as capabilities or uh, resources? Because if you are looking at technology as a resource, we should also think about people as a resource, even though we don't want to dehumanize people. But at the same time, we also want to give it the right time and planning and structure and preparing and training and well-being and whatever that comes with it. Are we seeing people as the resource? It's just like this is our resource technology and the throw it on people, they're gonna make it happen. Do you yeah, feel there I, is my, any yeah. space there? Yeah, my uh, my short response is um, as a woman working in technology, a leader in technology, right now I'm a vice president in our transformation office, which does include all digital transformations. So um, I oversaw software development life cycles, and we tend to have this initial perspective from what we learn in social about what tech is, right? Tech people, I, I'm no good at video games. I, you know, I, I have a degree in finance, you know, I, you know, so, you know, removing those norms and remembering it isn't this, you know, one, one, you know, thing fits all, right? So whatever we're doing, especially in technology, it's all about how is this, what we're creating is for our employees, is for the people. So even the way we implement, it has, it's, it was intended at their best interest. So the people are the core 
um, of, of why we're even there trying to, you know, create a process from the business analyst to the developer to the quality and pushing that, that technology out. It's intended to uh, simplify what that frontline employee has to experience every day. And I'm glad you mentioned that you, your background is not actually from technology. I was reading recently the latest report from PMI and Accenture is about like a transformation. And 70% uh, of the CEOs and the CTOs, they were claiming that they, they fail when it comes to transformation. And actually 93% or more of them were claiming that they need, um, they do need a chief transformation officer now. So they are seeing the value of non-tech maybe people to, to, to create this structure, but we're gonna go then later on to how do we deliver that. But I'd like to hear from Jeff because you, Jeff, have this approach of uh, gaming and positive psychology, and how do you go to this? Uh, I'm we're not going to talk just tech people, but like executive busy people, as we mentioned during our practice session. How do you go there and say, let's play about it? Like, you know, people need games and uh, buying. Well, yeah, it's easier that way. Yeah. Well, I've been trying to respond also to Jessica's point, you know, and, and your original question of like, how did we get here? Right. I've been to. I think six HR conferences in the last like seven weeks and many executives do not get what happened during the pandemic. A lot of them actually lost the trust of their staff and they have not rebuilt that trust. They have not had that conversation of like, and that's a question I would challenge executives to ask. Did we lose your trust? Did we gain your trust during this pandemic? And it has actually continued because I believe it was Gallup that did a study back in 2019 that found that 85% of people are disengaged at work. This was 2019. So the whole quiet quitting movement that's happening now is because people feel felt exploited, used, and not appreciated during the last two to three years. So why are we here? Because we haven't learned from our mistake, right? And we continue to do this. So when I'm speaking to executives, I'm always asking them, What's the worst behavior you're currently tolerating? Because that's the culture. That's the culture right there. You have set the tone, right? And I recently was talking to someone that used to work for Whole Foods before Amazon got bought it out. And she was an HR staffer in the store. And as soon as Amazon bought them, they removed all the HR people from the stores. And that's a perfect example of where is the priority? <laughs> is the priority for people or not for people, right? Because now you have staff that have to go to a call center to address their issue rather than to speak to a human being. And the more we as executives and leaders can embrace the fact of like, where do we want to go regarding leadership? Do we want to continue on this more toxic masculine leadership route that has been glorified by Elon Musk and Steve Jobs and Bezos? Or are we willing to finally embrace a more divine feminine and healthy masculine balance of leadership that's built off of intuition, collaboration, as well as aspects of healthy masculine leadership that have worked in the past. That's the decision we have to make. And that's what I try to do through my positive psychology work. But who cares, right? As long as uh, the rich people can go to Mars. Uh, I was watching that uh, YouTube video today about, and, and thinking because I love astronomy as well. And I'm like thinking about our panel tonight and I'm thinking, we're able to go to the moon and we still can manage an organization here. Like, come on people, like, what should it uh, go? So some of my thoughts are getting kind of funny, but uh, it's, it, it's making us think like, are we becoming invisible as humans or like how long should it take to think that people did feel used and frustrated and, and stressed as uh, Nidhi was mentioning before during COVID. And um, this is actual life and it takes time and people heal differently and organizations and teams set the tone, as you mentioned. So to, to add to this, Nidhi, uh, and, and you were very close to this topic as well, especially during pandemic, why, why do you feel this is happening? Why, why don't we learn? Even if we know now the reasons, but why don't we learn? You know, I think that corporations and CEOs and corporate leadership, they want to do better but they're, they don't have the skills. And I think that it's a skill development challenge because the reality is post pandemic, these last three years, 
any CEO, anybody who's in C-suite leadership is leading an organization filled with traumatized people. These are people that have survived a pandemic, a racial reckoning, war, global crises, uncertainty, financial instability. And these issues don't just disappear when somebody enters the workplace. Trauma shows up at work because trauma exists within us and you can't you can't create these two disparate parts of yourself where they're just disconnected like that. So I think leaders know that there is a, a a great resignation happening and it's because well-being hasn't necessarily been prioritized. In fact, in 2020, they did a, a study where they found 80% of people would leave their job because their mental health wasn't attended to. And in 2021, 23% of people did leave their job because their mental health wasn't attended to. This is something that leaders need to develop a skill set. But the challenge is recognizing what are those signs that somebody may be struggling from a well-being standpoint? And how do I create touch points as a C-suite leader throughout different facets of my organization. And that is going to look like a re-envisioning of what the C-suite job looks like, right? Because Sadita, I remember in our um, pre-call- I actually you mentioned that. Yeah. The, the how do you assess? Because we don't have a lot of time. So I would like actually to jump to the second question. Mm -hmm. Is like, because you kind of mentioned a bit of the, we talked about the why, why are we here and common uh, challenges here. Also, we, we kind of touch base a bit uh, the what. So what are these needs? And it does look like we're talking a lot about this um, well-being and mental uh, support and, and um, transitioning people as well in the smooth way that it, they, they do need that, regardless how fast technology uh, might be available out there. Uh, so how do you assess these needs then? Like what specifically executives need to do in order to assess when they, as I mentioned at the very beginning of this panel, their schedule is full of uh, calls, conference calls. That's all they, they, that's it. Like, I couldn't assess my own uh, project sponsor. You know, that's why I even quit the whole company because you can't have a project sponsor not have space for you for three weeks. So, is there any system in place or what do you recommend? Because if you go out there, I don't feel like at the executive level, people become mean. I don't think people become mean at executive level. I attended MIT executive courses with all CEOs, directors and above. I was a baby in the room. I heard their stories. They want this. But are we putting them in these roles with a structure that doesn't help them? Or how do we assess it? Well, I think we have to look at re-envisioning this. So what does this tangibly look like? Right now, as you mentioned, Sadita, there's a, a schedule full of meetings where people are disconnected. They're in their offices and are in board meetings and executive meetings, right? What needs to happen is that either A, you carve out time once a month where you are a real person face to face. I see a lot of executive leaders who may create like a curated video or they'll send out an email periodically to all personal elements of the team, right? But that's not enough. People want to know that their values align with the leader who's at the top of their company. And that requires you to be present and to engage. So we have to start shifting some of those meeting responsibilities to other people who may be able to handle that from an administrative standpoint. And I also think that we need to start investing money in hiring people whose sole responsibility is to check in on people's well-being. Now, what this looks like is if we look at uh, an individual like Gary Vaynerchuk, he's huge in the metaverse. He's also just really well known. He has a role within his company of chief heart officer. This lady's entire right. responsibility is to just go around and check in on people. And what he has found is that he's able to retain his employees at a significantly higher rate as a result. But I know Sokol and others are going to have thoughts on this too, um, but that's my yeah. initial thought. It's uh, actually, I, I do want to bring to Sokol, but I also want to mention uh, Kieran. Um, I don't know if she was able to join us. You can text me if you are able to join us. Um, she does claim her whole business about chief chief happiness uh, officer. So, but also have my own thoughts, second thoughts about these things because I do question. I like innovation, but at the same time, I question them because it feels like we have a full hundred percent use of it. What is HR doing then? Like this has always been since I studied leadership. I moved to corporate world. I never, in my experience, maybe I was unlucky. So an HR department act like people support. 
And I also attended the Lloyd conferences about HR here in Albania, where they're complaining about the fact, which is true, that they are not seen as business partners. They are just there to support how you hire, how you fire, depending on what the hiring manager wants. And that's pretty and if you're on saying this, because that has been my personal experience and organization that I've kind of collaborated with through ASQ, what is HR? Why do we need to invent this? Uh, I'm not saying fancy words, but I feel like we need these words as if the word human wasn't human enough. Like, why do we need to talk about heart? Are we like, <laughs> what's there in human that doesn't do it? Like, come on, help me here. <laughs> what's going on, uh, so called? To need this point, yeah. you, you, you know, you know, see that I think I think it's you know it's clear also from from what what uh, Jeff and 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 the the, the uh, need was was actually mentioning. So we are now in into this let's say new reality that that people are you know we we are not having let's say managing people at work. We are actually now into the new reality that we are managing people at their life. Okay, so because of okay. this hybrid way of working, because of this new reality that we are we are in, we we need now to take this this higher uh, let's say uh, responsibility as as leaders into the organization, and now seeing these people at their life and and embrace because they are actually put, making it's not not any longer uh, let's say work for living, but they are basically working while living. So, so this is a completely new concept and, and also the power of the technology is bringing lots of tools to the, to the leaders to be able to, to do the, the, past, the past role by, by just putting the right, the right uh, let's say, uh, KPIs into the tools and then uh, suddenly you have also the actions to go. So now the, the role of the, the leader I would I would also maybe allow myself to to play with the, with the naming a bit. So I would say now it's time to move from a kind of a chief executive officer, the one who is deciding. The decision is now we are more and more trusting computers to do the, the math and to do the right yeah. calculations. But now the role of these executive people is basically to become the chief experience officers. And by experience, I mean you know what is the experience of my people that are working in different levels because you know in the organizational leadership basically it's a it's a multiple step you know so even the flat organizations have you know they, nobody can reach to the, to the final employee that is serving the customer so so you need to think of you know how the wave is going to go from from the message that you are you are providing to the first level uh, on your organization up to the final level the, you know the, the ones who are serving to your customers so so as, as was, it was mentioned, you know, instead of, you know, spending time into, into uh, understanding how the things are working, I would, I would rather focus into how the, you know, what, what is the experience, understand the organization, what is the experience of my people, what is the experience of my customers, and what is the experience of my co, being that, let's say, uh, uh, shareholders or whoever is, let's say, other, other counterparts. So, so I see now more and more the need for the for the, uh, the top executives to to lift themselves a bit of let's say as an outsider and to to mm -hmm. be able to bring this feedback to their let's say leadership team and and be able to address it. So I I, I would say each organization has so talented people in each in all the levels. So that you don't really need to teach each and every one the chief finance officer or the marketing officer do this or do that. They are talented. They are ready to take over maybe at one time, even my role as a, as a main executive. So, so if I would think that way, then, then my, I, I would put myself self aside and try to, to, to so, understand my organization, how, how this, this feeling is, is across the, the entire, and then take care for people, for themselves. So that it is a right place and we and that we are also having or supporting the right values as an entire organization and i like so the word well. uh, experience uh here because um as we mentioned on the what is like what do we need to do and if we do need to have specific roles that actually are um or the executive type of roles kind of shift and or include in their vision the experience itself and it makes me think because both you and uh, Jessica as well come from a lot of tech type of uh, 
transitions at organizations and helping them. And it does feel like now we're getting also very, with a lot of technology, the response is very higher and higher quality and faster and faster and faster. So are we now expecting that our experience with people also responds in the same way that our technology is responding? And are we even losing patience with people thinking that we should expect the same as our technology response and quality and speed is? So when it comes to the third question, and I would like actually to open the question and answers uh, for our attendees. So if you have any question more specific to leading organizations, uh, please start writing them. But I want to close with uh, the last question we had about the how. So now that we know what we need to do, Let's make it tangible. Like, let's say tomorrow I go to my organizations and um, we have two who are on a consulting level and two are actually are in the executive roles. Even though you might not have it yet, what would you wish or what would you suggest or go to which department? Let's talk practical. Like, what takeaways can we can we start kind of selecting here for this to make it happen? Because we don't want to end up having just to talk about it next year again if the settings are the same because i'll just want to move to mars with alan musk and that's fine <laughs> because the, we can just talk over this over and over what tangibly can i tomorrow go and do for this to to start shifting a bit even though it might be just an awareness change or it doesn't have to be like a, a 360 degrees change so Jessica, for from your end, what would you maybe wish, or would you suggest? You are in a new role right now, so actually it's a good timing uh, if you have the support from leadership as well. But uh, what would you yeah, recommend? Um, so I well, definitely it's about. So what are we going to do? Um, but I did want to emphasize a little bit on that why we're here. It is why we're here is because we didn't um, prioritize the diversity of thought, the diversity of priority. Right. If we had had that diversity of thought when the data, when we become inundated with technology and data, data it tells us about what is the behavior, right? And then we say the behavior is this. This is what I'm going to go fix. With um, opening up the diversity of thought about the data, you're actually going to see different behaviors, and that's actually helps to create, you know, better decisioning by an executive. Um, fundamentally, um, since I do have, um, I'm triple certified um, in transformation. So my focus is always about how do we actually execute these visions once we understand the vision and understand the strategy, there is a component of project management, right? So we do need to, you know, figure out, make sure we have the right amount of people to help us, you know, make this possible and, you know, plan out this phased approach and understand that, you know, it, it's tactical. It is baby steps, you know, especially on these Titanic companies, right? We would like to, you know, transform overnight, but that's not a reality. Also that, you know, we implement change management, um, you know, making sure change management is the integration of the people in the process. Change management is the concept of, you know, prioritizing, creating awareness and creating a desire to want to do, you know, to move in that direction um, versus just walking in the next day and someone saying, we are going to do it like this, right? It's about buy-in and it's about, you know, really double checking that that's, you're moving in the right direction. The last piece of that is Scrum, right? So we talk about agile, that's the big buzzword in, the, in this world, right? But fundamentally, um, if you go back to the Egyptians building pyramids, we may they may not have said agile, but they did say change is constant, right? They did understand yeah. that fundamental principle. And the other fundamental principle they understood was that if you don't prepare, you prepare to fail, right? So fundamentally, if we, uh, you know, when we're designing a line and, and try to make a hybrid of these two fundamental truths, Right, we we will move the needle towards uh, creating that solid experience, like Soko mentioned, that solid experience for our people, and also that solid experience for our customer, because you know it is a, a business, you know that we have that we have to run. I'm, I'm glad actually what you point out is actually exactly your mixed background, and I do have a mix of quality and project management background myself and agile myself, and uh, I did face companies where they are like. 
pick which job do you want? Do you want project management? Do you want quality? Or do you want change management? Like, guys, like, if you're leading a project or, or a high-scale kind of transformation, they come together. You can't not have time for change management. Bring them to awareness, inclusion, to have and assess the, the mindset. And I'm pretty sure Jeff as well has its own experiences with clients that do do you experience this, Jeff? Like uh, they don't have a space or structure or where to put that. Like, what do you recommend when it comes to more than just saying this is important? What tangibly would you recommend them to do for that to actually show that it's important, not just to know that it is important? Because you do bring a good point about uh, walk your talk. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. Actions speak louder. Actions speak louder than words, right? And I think we have to understand first off. Responding earlier to your question of like, why do we need to bring happiness? We already have human resources. Well, human resources gets a bad rap, right? It's just hanging out with them for the last five weeks where everything gets outsourced to them. Even humanity gets outsourced to them and leaders are not taking responsibility for their own leadership. You know, people leave companies because of their leaders. They don't leave it because of HR, right? So what, so tangibly, what can leaders do? First, they have to be willing to address that question I said earlier. What's the worst behavior you're currently tolerating? Why are you tolerating that behavior? Can we address that? I think a lot of times we, you know, leaders, you know, a lot of executives that I speak to talk about innovation and, um, you know, what's the new thing we can do? Can we incorporate more AI or VR? No, just fire the toxic people that are currently at your organization and your retention goes up, your productivity goes up, your revenue goes up. All these things go up, but we're not addressing Crash that, right? organizations, so, Jeff here. <laughs> You know, so so all of this stuff, um, you know, needs to be addressed. But then in addition to that, leaders have to be asking themselves, what mistakes did I make? What mistakes did we make as an organization in the last two, three years? Let's have that conversation. Oh, I have too many meetings in order to have that conversation. Cancel those meetings. What is the most important thing right now? Retaining your employees. So why are you having meetings with the board talking about how you're going to reach your revenue goals for the fourth quarter when you're hemorrhaging employees over there. So where are your priorities? How are you actually establishing those priorities? And then how are you actually communicating in action that we care? Are you funding your employee resource groups, right? Are you actually um, giving time for your, for your middle management to connect with their staff? Right? Are you actually helping out HR by giving them, you know, the freedom to actually analyze each of your departments and see where the middle managers are that shouldn't be there, that never should have been promoted in the first place? Because let's be honest, some of them shouldn't be there. So when we're asking hard questions and having those difficult conversations, that's the tangible way we can start to address a lot of these issues. Absolutely, you you do need uh, you do need a structure in place as as you mentioned, like uh, taking the time, making it a priority, but also make it a priority for other um, people that are reporting to you, and to actually have that space because that also signals, as you mentioned, that the type of leadership that they are exemplifying basically as well, and setting the tone for the culture to be based because. Culture looks like it's just this uh, fluffy word. <laughs> it's uh, but it also has its own pillars and it needs its own structure to be built. So to to add to this, uh, Nidhi, from your end, and again, uh, feel free to add any other thoughts uh, and questions. I'm bringing kind of some of these questions that I have also from other uh, webinars we we we'll talk about leadership and what kind of came across is what we are talking about here. If anything, a kind of case specific, please feel free to share. Nidhi, on your on your end. Yes, well, I loved everything that Jeff shared, and I, to build on that. Into therapy. <laughs> Well, I think that the visibility is really important when it comes to leaders. So an organization that I worked with, uh, it was right around the overturning of Roe v. Wade here in the United States. And the CEO came to the meeting and acknowledged that this is a really difficult day. And I know this is going to be an upcoming difficult period for women and people who can get pregnant. So let's have an open conversation and open dialogue. And the reason he was able to do that is because he overcame his own discomfort. So often leaders ask the question, how are you doing? 
but they don't know how to be able to active listen, validate and support and really be present for what the answer is. That is a, what we call a soft skill. That's actually an essential skill for C-suite leadership to develop. So I think we have to do some leadership development skills around how do we have these difficult conversations and what comes up for me as a human being who happens to be an executive as I'm hearing somebody share about their mental health challenges. We also have to look at not only intervention on an individual level, but on a systemic level. So I often yeah. will see C-suite leadership put into place things like the Calm app or Insight Timer as interventions and meditation classes and yoga classes, which those are a great starting place, right? But what are we doing systemically to address the issues that are causing the challenges with mental health and well-being? So often we're treating the symptom but we're not treating the problem. And the problem is that there's an overloading of work, so we need to distribute work differently. We need to have resources more readily available to staff. And we don't, we shouldn't be waiting for people to reach out to us when they're struggling. We need to be proactive in addressing and recognizing that everybody has mental health and how can we start to get these conversations going. So um, from a policy standpoint and a systemic standpoint, Look at what are my benefits for mental health? Do I have EAP services that are an option? Do my employees know that those EAP services are confidential? Because a lot of employees that I speak to, they don't think that those services are confidential. And so then the, the possibility of them utilizing it is slim to none, right? Because they don't feel safe. What's your time off policy? If you have one, then you should have a policy where it's use it if you have it. No questions asked. No shaming about how much time you've taken off, just an understanding that the people that you're leading are adults and they know how to take care of themselves. They know what they need. So just trust in that. Trust in the fact that they're going to utilize their leave as they need to. These are some tangible ways for leaders at the C-suite level to intervene so that mental health and well-being are prioritized. Absolutely. Those are all uh, very practical and, um, as you mentioned, it's just not an individual level, but also a structure and a systematic approach because if my well-being is impacted by the fact that the, the work is so messed up, the way departments work with one another is just a total mess, then I don't need you to send me to a therapist for free. I need you to fix the mess that's in another organization because we want it preventive versus corrective. So. Yeah, uh, but it depends I, on the case. Jessica, yeah, please. Uh, yeah, I want to just quickly chime in with Nisi and just say I'm glad that you brought up with the United States and our at will, right? I've worked overseas where, you know, you see all these other types of benefits and, you know, we have a very unique situation here. Just because we sign a contract that's at will doesn't mean that we should be managed at will, that we should have a at will culture Stress or at will. <laughs> an at will experience, right? And I think um, an executive who, who's, who taps into you know, that fear and this, you know, this uh, trauma of, you know, just the, you know, that you're always in this at will state. And the more we can just move away from that, um, Jeff, you mentioned about, um, or several have mentioned about the, the great, the, um, uh, the fact this uh, quiet quitting, well, there's also quiet firing, right? So if you're just laying off people one day they're there and the next day they're not, well, you know, let's, we got to talk Message. about that. Right, you know, what programs do you offer? Not just like gone to here today, gone tomorrow. Those are these fundamental things that as executives, if we don't fix those, that's the systemic that I think Needy's talking about. If we don't fix the systemic, then you know, it is, you know, actions speak louder than words, like Jeff said. And I don't know how at will this is when, uh, because I lived both in US and Europe. So uh, I come from 10 years of experience in each country from a work perspective. But I don't know how at will it is when you are expected to answer the calls after five. That's not very much at will. And I keep a asking executives, why do you do that? Have you tried to not even respond? Let's see, are you fired next day or what's happening? No, but I'm expected to. Like, no, because a customer 
But if you are, when I'm sitting in Amsterdam at five o'clock, I kept with my US mindset, let's do this because now we got the point and the other person is online from China, whatever. They're like, Sadiqa, I don't care about your still US mindset. Wake up, I'm going to have a drink, whatever. And it's not even expected. So I look like the weird one, like the toxic one here. And I'm the same person. So am I, we're talking about executive uh, here, level leadership, but I want to also, because we're also right on time, to bring to maybe the next uh, panel, which might follow uh, next year, about leading self again, because we also have the power to leading up. I don't, I don't say that this is the solution for everything, but we also shouldn't just expect from executives and then just think that we are just here to, to absorb whatever comes to us. So I'd like to actually, I see Kiran joined us. So I'd like to have her say uh, anything that she'd like to share. It might be our last panel today. So that's why I'm very happy to actually be here together again. The and I have been, uh, first of all, great, great listening to you guys all in the background. So Dita, I have been running these webinars for quite a few years now, and it has been a great relationship and we're kind of differing in different sections as of next year. So it's good to be together again. Um, one parting message from my side on this topic is I don't think so. One is a solution. It needs all. Um, you need to do all the efforts from an executive level, you know, developing your skills, looking at the right uh, processes, improvements, and directions you have to give to your teams and departments. Bringing the clarity, I think, biggest thing executive miss from their side is a not having the right skills they require to be on the seat they're sitting, and b not giving a clear uh, direction. Visions are written in the and put in frames. But they are become meaningless when you ask five people, they give you five versions of those visions. So that's probably where we can do more improvement. Um, at the team levels and individual levels, yes. I think uh, ASQ did an awesome job this year by doing leading self, leading teams and leading organization because it's a combined effort. So Sadita touched on the happy organization. You brought a smile on my face. Uh, gets me going. Uh, that that is exactly what it its focuses on, uh, giving the people deep clarity that they know these are the five things I'm responsible. I came at nine. Did I leave at five or three or seven? Did I do the five things I'm asked to do every day? If I did it, I can go with a happy heart. I fulfill the requirements I had on my hand. As a teamwork, you want to make sure your teams are working together, but eliminating the silos of every department and creating a more unified environment. And we talked a little bit about HR. I would say HR should not be looked as an HR department. That's more operational side of HR, you know, doing the day to day, listening to people, answering their and doing their taking care of their vacation and payrolls and so on. HR needs to be on the top executive side where it's a strategic move to support all the other strategies that you have in play. And if HR is not raised to that bar where they become the voice of employees and voice of your customers, then you are not really utilizing HR to the highest possible way they can be. Right? So it's, it's all together a full 360 uh, effort that requires is required to actually bring that culture that can bring not only happiness with people, satisfy your customers that are looking for experience every minute nowadays. And we are challenged with 35% hike this year of cost everywhere. So there's so many mega trends that this particular decade is, has on its hand that if, if all these combined efforts are not made, we're leaving a gap somewhere or the other which slows us down or brings us back backward. This is why Karen and I can always talk for hours and hours because there's so much uh, good content she, she has experienced, but also she works so hard on. And um, well, this is a good uh, space to actually and see what other people are going and facing. And that's what was the purpose of this uh, panel tonight. So thanks so much for sharing each of you your personal experiences at the very personal level, but also your uh, professional experience and what and how open you are to transition and be willing to say, am I doing also uh, the right way? Or is there anything that I can take my part uh, aside and reflect on myself as a, as a person, then as a leader, executive leader comes, uh, comes after.
So thanks to uh, each of you. I would like, uh, Maget, do you have any anything to share? This was your first uh, attendance, so <laughs> it's just uh, crazy people out there saying we're just going to fire somebody at executive level and just shut down companies or, or take them to therapy. <laughs> So thanks, uh, thanks for being here. And um, uh, Richard as well, thanks so much for attending tonight as well. It's been uh, a great five uh, years together and uh, we hope we'll still, uh, of course, we're gonna gain, keep connection because we're just attached now, addicted. Unless we go to needy for therapy, we can get away from each other. <laughs> so thanks everyone, it's been, uh, it's been a great time. And I uh, would like to share, as uh, Richard mentioned, that there is um, an actual workshop of two hours that uh, one of our uh, actual chair, like Stephanie and um, uh, Marilyn, will be sharing about this assessment tool that we have, but bringing it on a, on a workshop level to, to see how we can uh, lead ourselves and be better leaders. So that kind of uh, transition to self-leadership uh, level will be coming up uh, November 1st. We'll be sharing, I'll uh, post this uh, webinar on YouTube uh, on coming these days, so maximum a week. So please uh, feel free to share your comments there. If any questions, feel free to reach out to our panelists. Great to have them, so much to share. And uh, sorry about five minutes late, but I think this topic would go on over and over. So thanks for coming together and making it such an aligned experience. Thanks, everyone. Talk to you another time. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Take care. Thank you.